you know, a very subtle but implicit hope from this work in Questions or the Answer is that somehow we as human beings can keep our questions not only alive, but keep them increasingly better through potentially AI-assisted help such that it doesn't out-question us. Hi, I'm James Taylor, business creativity and innovation keynote speaker, and this is The Creative Life, a show dedicated to you, the creative. If you're looking for motivation, inspiration, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's an author, musician, entrepreneur, performer, designer, or thought leader. They'll share with you their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, and much, much more. You'll find show notes for this episode, as well as free training on creativity, over at jamestaylor.me. Enjoy this episode. Hey there, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted to welcome onto the show today Hal Gregerson. Hal Gregerson is the Executive Director of the MIT Leadership Center, a Senior Lecturer in Leadership and Innovation at the MIT Sloan School of Management, a prolific author and a motivational speaker. Ranked by Thinkers 50 as one of the world's 50 most innovative minds, he has authored or co-authored 10 books, including the best-selling The Innovator's DNA, written with Jeff Dyer and Clayton Christensen. His latest book is called Questions Are the Answer, a breakthrough approach to your most vexing problems at work and in life. And it's my great pleasure to have Hal with us today. So welcome, Hal. Glad to be here, James. I'm good to be with you. So share with everyone what's happening in your world just now. Well, uh, just now, <laughs> I'm mesmerized by the clouds and I'm asking too many questions about why is it so beautiful today? How's that for a completely unrelated answer? <laughs> but, that, but that's a good thing. Is this, so that, there's that, there is, you know, what do they say? Blue sky thinking. You have some lovely blue skies there as well. So you're looking out into the clouds. Those kind of questions are coming to you as well. Your, this book has had, um, I, I love this book. Uh, Obviously, the foreword written by Ed Catmull, who wrote one of my favorite books on creativity, Creativity uh, Inc. as well. But what was I found fascinating was the number of comments you had from from people from kind of different backgrounds, not just your usual kind of innovation type folks, but you had also there um, Tony Robbins, a very nice crew, obviously Mark Benioff, Salesforce, Arian, Arian Huffington, uh, Tim Brown of uh, IDEO. So what inspired you to write this book at this stage, What at this time? Well, James, for 30 years, I've been deeply interested in how do leaders do great work. And literally three decades ago, I was starting on leaders going global and how do you land in a new country and figure it out. And then it was a decade trying to figure out what if you're transforming your organization. The last decade was how do you innovate effectively as a leader. There was this common thread through that three decades of work, which was all of these leaders, whether they were, whether they were globalizing, innovating, or transforming, they were exceptional at asking questions other people didn't ask. And so after the last book I wrote, I was like, I'm going to dive very deep on this very specific leadership skill of asking the right questions. And so as you mentioned, it's been an amazing journey with 200 plus creatives, the people you mentioned, but folks like Andreas Heineke, who founded a nonprofit social enterprise called Dialogue in the Dark, to Daniel Lamar at Cirque du Soleil, to John Hunt, the TBWA the Global Creative Director in Johannesburg, South Africa. Just an amazing range of people. And what I found when I distilled down that data and looked at the common themes is that all of them were very systematic about putting themselves in places and with people that caused them to ask questions other people missed. So you, you use this phrase, catalytic questions, questions that have have an effect uh, as well. I'm interested, one of the, the, the that you, you speak about these different, almost different levels of questions. You, you mentioned some work done by uh, Robert Pate and, and Neville Bremer about um, uh, different styles of questions, because like all, all questions are not being are not equal, I guess. So in your, in your research, what did you find in terms of not just the, the number, the quantity of questions people were asking, but the, the quality, the type of questions that people were asking in order to get those, those illuminations? Now, great question. So question itself is a quest. And so to find what I call a catalytic question, it's this kind of question is one that challenges a fundamentally wrong assumption and surfaces it in a way that people are, uh-oh, but not in a bad way, in the sense that now we've surfaced this bad assumption about the way we're operating and working in the world, but it's also giving us energy to go forward and do something about it. And that's why I call it, call it catalytic. 
It surfaces a bad assumption and gives us energy to make the world better. But these things don't happen overnight. They're not just like poof experiences. They come from a lot of hard work. If you take someone like Mark Benioff, he worked for 15 years in selling large-scale enterprise software. He then takes a sabbatical. That entire time, he's customer-facing, constantly getting data about what's wrong, what's working, what's not, and why with Oracle software. Then he's trying to figure out how do we sell large enterprise software to small and medium-sized enterprises. He talks to thousands of people, bumps into all kinds of passive data, and then at the end of all that work, he's asking in that tunnel to the endpoint of a catalytic question, thousands of questions, but then he lands on that moment, which was, what if we sold enterprise level software like Amazon sells books on the web? Now today, 2018, it's like, well, duh. But back then, people thought he was crazy. But that kind of inevitable question, like Mark asked, actually challenged a false assumption. You can't sell enterprise level software to small businesses but it also opened up an answer in a way that other people couldn't see, but he could because he'd been there close to the data points that would give him new direction. So there's, there's that, the um, Voltaire had that quote, which said, uh, you know, judge a person by their questions, not by their answers. As as someone goes up in an organization, you, you kind of assume that at the start of an organization, they're gonna be asking lots of questions because they don't know the industry and, and everything. And then as they get further and further up, it feels like there's almost this assumption that they should know everything, that they should kind of not be asking, and they should be giving answers, not not questions. Uh, is that something that you, you, you kind of, you found in your book? Because, you know, I would imagine as you get further and further up, those people maybe are expected by the people that, that are working underneath them to have all the answers, not to be asking questions. I remember vividly this experience in Singapore a few years ago. I'd given a speech about questions or the answers, and a CEO tapped me on the shoulder. I turned around and he said, you were spot on. I just became a CEO. My entire career, I'd been, I'd been hired, promoted, advanced for giving all the smart, right answers. But in this role of a CEO, it's not about answers. Initially, it's about asking the right questions. And he said, it's an excruciating transition from being an answer-driven leader to a question-driven one. Now that goes all the way back, James, to, I don't know what it's like in the UK or the rest of the world, but I've seen concrete systematic data from the US for the last 50 years. For children in schools between the ages of six through university, they're sitting in class six hours a day for a month. The average student asks six questions per month about the content of the course, total. Wow. The average teacher, in contrast, is asking 50 to 100 questions per hour. I ask you a question, you're the student, I'll give you one second to respond. If you don't respond, I'll ask you a follow-up question, I'll give you a half second to respond to that one. If you don't follow up, I'll turn and go to the next person. Children learn really fast. Answers matter more than questions. Then they get hired by companies that are filling slots with people out of college and university who can fill in and do an answer and fill a role. And it's no wonder that by the time that CEO became the CEO, he in this case was largely not capable of asking a catalytic question. That's the challenge we're up against, but just because that challenge is there doesn't mean that you or I couldn't become better at asking better questions, even catalytic ones. It's like that, 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 that muscle, is, that, that question uh, answering muscle has kind of become loose. It's not, it's, not, it's not been getting worked out over the years. As, you, as you're saying this, I'm wondering, as you mentioned, like in schools, for example, um, you know, the, uh, I think it was Picasso said, every, every child is born uh, an artist. The problem is how they remain an artist when they grow up. And you see that happen in the States. I know you have the fifth grade slump where creativity has been increasing. And then around about fifth grade, it starts to decline. And as you're saying this, I'm thinking about all those, if I think of the average four-year-old or five-year-old, they're saying, why, 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 why? They're, they're asking that, that why question. It's probably to the, their parents are like tearing their hair out. Um, and then obviously as, as they get older, that, that, that question part of them is being, being subsumed, is being pushed down as well. So as an adult, someone working, how do we start to reclaim that questioning? Those asking those catalytic questions, if that muscle has become a little bit soft uh, over the years? No, absolutely. So there's an individual me response. There's an organizational, what if I'm a leader response? I'll start with the individual. How does that sound? Perfect. Uh, so I don't care who we are on planet Earth. We all have challenges and problems that we're stuck on. 
you've got one today, I've got one today. If I step back, it's like I'm stuck and I don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. My suggestion is something I discovered 20 years ago that I've done for the last 20 years with thousands of leaders and 85% of the time in four minutes, people start to become unstuck. And here's what I call it. It's a question burst. It's a burst of nonstop questions about a challenge you and I might have. So if I were sitting with you, or I could do it right now, but we don't have time for it, I could share in two minutes or less my challenge with you. And then what we would do, James, is we would, we would take a piece of paper and generate in four minutes as many questions as we possibly can. The best challenging, toughest questions we could ask each other about my challenge or your challenge. We do that in four minutes. Here are the rules. No answers during that four minutes and no explanations about why we're asking the questions. Both of those rules are intended to keep us from giving too much context and we start walking people into the corner that we're already stuck in. So no answers, no explanations about why we're asking. Four minutes, on average the day would say we'll get 15 to 20 questions. If my questioning muscle is weak, I might get 10 to 15 questions. If it's strong, it's 15 to 25. At the end of that four minute session, people are in a better positive emotional state. 85% of us will have reframed our challenge at least somewhat, and 85% of us will have at least one new potential answer to our problem. It works, and so then we switch. Now it's your turn. Two minutes you explain your challenge, four minutes, nothing but questions about your challenge. And in that 12 minute commitment to each other, we will each walk away with a better perspective, a reframe challenge, and being able to go forward with the question in that list that we care enough about that we're gonna do something about it. And I, I'm gonna finish on that just for a moment, which is we all know people who ask a thousand questions. And most, most of the world calls those people annoying. Mm -hmm. And the way to get beyond being annoying in asking questions is be responsible with the questions you ask. And that's what I mean. We've got this list now of 20 questions. I'm going to pick one of them. I'm going to take responsibility for getting out, getting out, getting into the world and getting an answer to that question. So as you, you work with lots of different types of organizations, people in different types of roles, I'm imagining in that, in that time, that, that session that people have where they're, they're kind of generating all those questions, those people who are more verbal, let's say, often people that work in the sales function or the marketing functions, they're going to have no problems with that. Um, what about those people who maybe their, their role is maybe it sits back there, they're in the engineering side, for example, they're not so, they're, that, that's not how they work best. Does that, that exercise still work well with those types of folks? Oh, absolutely. So in fact, it's to their advantage, not disadvantage. Because by setting up a situation where the rules of conversation are so awkwardly twisted, what? I can't answer questions? What? I can't explain why I'm asking them? That kind of changed conversation style actually opens up windows that otherwise wouldn't be there for introverts or quieter people to say something, to contribute the question. And guess what? Those folks are usually so observant of what's working, what's not, and why that their questions can be profound. We just don't create the space for the questions to surface. And this question versus process is one way of, of many potential ones that we give everyone a chance in a room, a team meeting, a conversation to contribute that otherwise wouldn't. So that's in the, in the individual perspective. How do you then extend that into from an organizational standpoint so it becomes a, a questioning culture, a questioning type of organization? How does that develop? Well, whether it's Walt Benninger, who's the CEO of Charles Schwab, or Ed Catmull, who's the president of Pixar and Disney Animation Studios, or whether it's Mark Benioff at Salesforce.com, or Danielle Lamar at Cirque du Soleil, all of them wake up in the morning with a concern on their mind, which is, how do I create spaces within my organization, places where people they can ask the tough questions? And in organizations that aren't vibrant, alive, and innovating, they don't know where those spaces are. But if you walk into a place like Pixar, they discovered early on when they were building their first movie, which is which was Toy Story, every, every movie sucks at the beginning. The story stinks, it's horrible, it's bad. The director's trying to put something into it. And half the time a Pixar movie, the story is the director's story. It's personal, it's real, it's theirs. Now, 
They're in a creative effort. They're stuck. They know the story stinks. How do I get this better? They have what they call a brain trust at Pixar or a story trust or a story trust now at Disney where you or I as the director go into a room knowing that for three hours nonstop, a group of other equally qualified directors and others are going to give us nothing but positive and negative feedback about the movie. In fact, if they're in that room, they're responsible for giving us unvarnished, completely candor, full of candor feedback about what's working and what's not. If that's my movie and that's partly my story, by the end of that three hours as a director, I'm exhausted emotionally. I often, they'll often send them home for the weekend to kind of recover from the whole thing. But I'm, I'm guessing there, there has to be that, that, there has to be that base level of, of trust and intimacy in order for people to both give and receive that, that creative feedback. Absolutely. And so what's interesting is one of the very junior anim animators I interviewed at Pixar told me about his experience as an undergraduate preparing to work at, Dis at Disney. The department chair told them the first day of their undergraduate degree in animation, there's one thing you'll do to get kicked out of this program. And they're like, whoa, what's that? You share information you have with someone else that could help them solve their problem. If you don't do that, you're going to get kicked out just like that. And guess what? It's the same sort of logic at Pixar. You're coming in with incredible talent, but if you hoard your talent and information, and if you're unwilling to be helpful that way with other people, you're not going to last at that place. And so they work overtime to bring in people who have this deep commitment to work in a world that's trust-based rather than fear-based, because you're, you're spot on right, it's crucial for that kind of moment to work. And, and as you're saying, I'm reminded of even in history, and you, know, you go back to the, the ancient Greeks, they had this symposiums where they would analyze, then you had the, uh, the in the, the Renaissance, then you had in Edinburgh during the Enlightenment, they had their clubs, they all they had their clubs where they would go and debate those ideas. Then in Vienna, 1800s, 1900s, they had the, the coffee shops, the cafes. So this is like yep. basically just the modern, it's, it's, it's creating a safe spaces. It's probably a dangerous phrase to use, because I know it gets used in, in different ways in, in universities, but that trusted place where you can people can be honest and they can be truthful with each other what's working what's not and asking those questions one of the one of the the, the the questions you mentioned in this book which really made made me laugh was a question that steve jobs asked a journey i've almost every day i thought it was a fabulous question can you, can you tell us what that question was so johnny's like a creative that's his role get ideas get cool ones get lots of them make them happen and so he's like just bursting with all of these ideas nonstop. And Steve Jobs is like, what could I do here? What question might actually channel all this Johnny Ive energy in a better way? And so he decided to ask that question, which is, what have you said no to today, Johnny? Every day he would ask him that. That's the kind of recursive question you ask it over and over again in order to accomplish something great and what's funny is um, it was just a few months ago Ed Catmull sent me a note a handwritten note and said how good questions are recursive meaning the really good questions are worth asking over and over again because they create conversations that we otherwise wouldn't have that could make you or this place better and that's what Steve Jobs was doing with Johnny Ive. And I think what did you say? I think that's a great question. It, it, it reminded me a little bit of there was the one that uh, Jay Papazan and Gary Keller, the, 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 the one thing, which is the question, that, which is a little bit like the Pareto principle. What is the one thing that you could do today, which if done well, can make things other things either unnecessary or basically unrequired? It's, like, it's, it's a focusing you mentioned this kind of catalyst, that kind of focusing question that you have at the core. Um, you mentioned Ed Catmull there as well. Something that you mentioned that he had in common with a lot of very good people that ask questions, Ray Dalio, for example, uh, Tony Robbins, Oprah Winfrey, is they they have these times in their day that they schedule to uh, fill the well. Um, can can yep. you describe what those those daily practices are that you just noticed because you interviewed so many incredibly creative people? Well, the the, the the fundamental conditions that all of these creatives create in one form or another for catalytic questions to surface is they put themselves in situations where they're regularly wrong more than right, 
uncomfortable instead of comfortable, and reflectively quiet. And that's what we're talking about here, James. And so what's surprising, not so surprising, is many of the people I interviewed actually were meditators. They systematically created that sort of space to meditate. And in fact, I was just at the Salesforce New York Tower that they're, they're in, which is similar to the one in San Francisco. They have dedicated meditation spaces, and people really do use them. It's a reflective space where we can step back and rethink and approach the world differently. So it could be a meditative space, like I'm just describing, that does that. Diane Green, who now is the, the president of um, Google Cloud and found, a co-founder of VMware years ago, her reflective space is on a sailboat, which she learned to do as a little girl growing up. That's where she would go and have that kind of reflective space. Um, and so if you go to... Um, if you go to so so that's the question is like where do we where do we have that moment of reflection and you know you mentioned um, Ed Catmull and Steve Jobs Steve Jobs would regularly kind of go at Ed Catmull and he's Steve was so quick and so fast and so full of insight and pushing hard that sometimes Ed would just like I need to have space and he'd give it a day he'd give it a week before he would respond really. And so that's the issue is how do we create that sort of reflective space on a regular basis? So as we're starting to move, obviously you're at MIT, you're seeing a lot of incredible things come out around the world of artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics. How is or is that changing the the time that we have and the, the kind of the quality of the questions that we can ask? Because we think now, you know, machine learning, they, they have that huge tactical capability that we don't necessarily have. But us as humans have a little bit of an advantage at the moment uh, when it comes to st maybe strategic thinking, cre creativity. So do you see the AI machine? Is that going to help us? And, and what are some of the, the initial interesting areas of, of exploration around questioning in AI? It's a powerful question. So that's the kind of the next research I'm in the midst of, which is figuring out what is the intersection of AI and inquiry? It's a great question. And so if you look at AI, for example, today, it's not really good sometimes at catching really passive data. So one of the recent research studies basically was it put a faint elephant in the, a faint elephant in a room, and the computer AI was trying to figure out what was in the room, and it couldn't quite figure it out. And and so the point I'm getting at is the following: these catalytic questions often come from passive data, very small, nuanced sort of information. And that's the stuff that computers are still figuring out. And we as humans have an incredible capacity to capture those subtleties, to capture the new, to capture the surprises. And so there are great opportunities. And talking with Jeff Wilkie, who runs the CEO of Amazon Worldwide in terms of consumer products, Jeff is actively trying to answer the same questions, James, which is, you know, how do I integrate this machine learning AI into my own inquiry method? And so the point becomes that kind of machine learning and AI can be incredibly helpful around routinized knowledge and the kind of stuff we can Google, but it's not the kind of approach I would use to actively seek out passive data that's not actively coming at me. And, and this is really crucial. Yeah. As for most leaders in the world, they're actively getting very active data shoved right at them nonstop all day. Be it the internet, the systems, whatever. But these leaders who ask these questions that change the world, they construct their own personal world and the world around them such that they're actively seeking passive data. They're getting up. They're getting out, they're getting into the world, they're getting exposed to things that otherwise they would miss, just like the computer does, and they put together questions and answers that others just miss. It's, it's interesting, as you're saying, I'm, there's, there's, a, there's a quote, and I can't remember the quote now, but it could even be Picasso that said it. It was something like, um, machines are stupid, they only give me answers. Uh, something like that, because you're just saying about that, that, that difference that we have as the humans, be, that, that questioning ability. Um, I, I'm really fascinated by this here because 
you know, you look at people like Gary Kasparov that talks a lot about centaurs and centaur chess, humans paired with, with AIs and, and some of the most incredible things are going on just now and that. And I, I, I've actually got great hope that actually this is, those technologies are going to help us elevate the kind of questions that, that we can answer as well. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that next book. Obviously, you're just in the process of like getting this, but I know you're probably already moving on to the next thing as well. But um, it's great to see that you're, you're kind of moving that way in your work as well. Well, I mean, one, so I just picked up uh, Stephen Hawking's Brief Answers to the Biggest, biggest Questions, and um, his last chapter is about exactly what we're talking about. <clears throat> and to me, it's, and at MIT and, and other places like MIT, people are actively working with the, the, the AI implants physically in us so that we can do that complete melding. Um, but the challenge is the following. It's not a question of if that will happen. It will happen. It is happening. The question for me is, who is going to be asking the better questions mm -hmm. as time rolls on? And so my name is Hal. Mm -hmm. The computer in 2001, the Space Oddity's name was Hal, capital H-A-L. And that's the computer that went crazy and killed people. I hope that doesn't happen. And so, you know, a very subtle but implicit hope from this work in Questions or the Answer is that somehow we as human beings can keep our questions not only alive, but keep them increasingly better through potentially AI-assisted help such that it doesn't out-question us. Because to me, if and when that happens, that is deeply disconcerting. What's the best question you've ever asked of yourself? Is, is there a, one question you've asked before which has provided more light bulb moments, more of those kind of eureka moments than any, any other. So Tony Robbins, when I interviewed him, um, talked about what he calls a primary question, and I call it a keystone question, but it's the same pr fundamental thing. Whether we know it or not, you and I are living a question. There's one that probably is guiding our everyday activities, and we sometimes don't even realize it. So here's the deal. In 2014, I'm getting up to give a speech in La Jolla, California. I go down to the place where I'm supposed to give it. I have pressure on my chest, but I think it's just anxiety. I do some deep breathing, giving 90-minute speech, sit down. Then I have pressure on my chest again. My neck starts to ache. I'm feeling nauseous. I go up to my room where my wife is. She's like, what's wrong with you? And I tell her, and she's like, are you having a heart attack? And I said, honestly, I don't know. So I looked on the computer, heart attack symptoms, and I'm like, yes, I am having a heart attack, Susie. <laughs> and she's like, well, I just exercised. Let me take a shower. We'll go to the hospital. I'm like, no, let's go to the hospital now. So we ran to the hospital. I woke up the next day with three stents in my heart and um, two 90% blocked arteries. Two weeks later, um, I was a typical male, didn't talk a lot about what I was experiencing, talked to a counselor, therapist, who I've been working with, um, we have a very complex blended family that is wonderful, that has its challenges at moments. And um, so she knew my story and she looked at me and she said, Hal, if you don't stop being nice, you're gonna kill yourself. And she was surfacing in one singular moment, my primary question, which was, how do I how do I be nice to people? And that means saying no more often than you should say yes. Well, that comes from growing up in a home that I had a very emotionally abusive father and sometimes physical, but it's nothing compared to what a lot of people deal with. So I'm not trying to over, over, you know, state that, um, but it is what it was. And I grew up wanting to please an adult figure, my father. And what I didn't realize until that moment in 2014 was not only in my personal life, but my professional life, I'd spent a lot of energy living a single question, which is how can I make you happy? Well, you work really hard when you're living that question. And you can accomplish a lot of things trying to prove things to other people. But it can also cause you to die, to have a heart attack. And so I've tried to reframe that, and it's taken me several years. It's not an overnight process. And so now the question that I try to live more fully is how might I reflect your light right now? How might I better reflect the light, truth, goodness inside of you right now? And that might mean that I do something that absolutely makes you mad. 
But that might be the best way in which I could help you or somebody else in my life actually reflect their light better to the world, make a bigger difference. It may sound like the same, but really, emotionally, it's a different way of the world. And so, you know, that's my invite often when I'm working with people as a coach or whatever. Let's explore this because these are important questions. That, that is a beautifully subtle question uh, as well in terms of op- opening up things. I and mean, it kind of, it, 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 at the very start, the opening uh, of the book, Ed Catmull does the, the, the preface of the book and he, and he says something which kind of links to that, I guess, which is, um, although he's talking about in an organizational context, he talks about instead of having mission statements, what about if we had mission questions, uh, mm-hmm. which I, I love. I think I, I would love if, you know, most Companies don't live by their mission statements anyway, and they feel like a very fixed. So having mission questions feels like something that's living, breathing. It's developing. It's, it could go on for many generations asking those questions. I absolutely, I love that, and I love how you've, you've kind of re, you reframe that question in your own life as well. Um, as we start to finish up here, I'd love to know: what, Do you have any um, online resources or apps or tools you find very useful in the work that you do in terms of? help us asking those questions helping others ask those questions or just in your writing work well in addition to the book um, I've got a commitment that's long term um, that there's an online site called the 424 project and what that's all about is that if you and I spend four minutes a day for a full year it adds up to about 24 hours and what if we spent that four minutes just trying to ask the better question Instead of being so, so overly focused on just trying to get answers every day. What if we step back enough, and it might be doing a question burst, that exercise I mentioned earlier, four minutes. It might be reflectively writing in my journal in order to st- step back and think twice about you know, the questions I'm asking today. There are different things I might do, but, but that's one way, is just to sort of think to ourselves, in the next 24 hours, where might I find a four-minute window to actually ask better questions? And I've honestly found that question burst method to be really powerful around personal and professional issues. It doesn't matter. It can be done by myself, can be done in trios, can be done in teams, it can be done informally, it can be done formally. A questioning journal also can be very powerful, just keeping track of the questions we're asking. Richard Branson at Virgin has done this for decades. He's got thousands and thousands of questions in journals and insights and answers and potential experiments, but he tracks it. He keeps track of it, and he tries to improve the questions he's asking. And so one of the things in any field or work, if we're trying to get better, we have to attend to it. Asking questions is no different. But I have watched and seen people who maybe describe themselves as not great at asking questions. Use some of these skills. And, and those are more skills. But the more important thing, James, is looking at my schedule today, tomorrow, and asking myself, where am I going to be? Who am I going to be with that might cause me to feel a little uncomfortable and be wrong about something? And if that isn't happening, I'm living in a bubble of isolation, and I'm asking all the same questions, and at some point they're gonna be the dead wrong ones. So why not be a little more wrong today instead of dead wrong tomorrow, I guess is my <laughs> point of this. And, that, and that's a habit, you know? That, that's just, how do we spend our energy? And, and to me, that's the greatest gift we can not only give to ourselves, but to those around us. Wonderful. So I'm going to, I'll put a link here for everyone so they can find, go to that 424 uh, project. I, I love the idea of that, taking those, those four minutes every each day. And if you were to recommend um, one book, not one of your own books, a book you think maybe people should read, should consider more, maybe a book that ha- hasn't had the audience you think it maybe deserves, uh, more people should read, what would that book be? One of the books that I found terrific is The Coaching Habit. Um, it really is a book of seven questions that coaches can use in order to guide their conversations to a better place. I am rarely, if ever, an advocate of books that list questions because my whole, the whole premise of my research around this is that we have to live in the moment and have to ask a better question, the new, new unique one. But this book is really powerful in terms of the questions that might help me as a coach help someone else in their life or their work. 
wonderful the coaching habit michael bongistani who's been one of our guests here as well great great book what about a slightly unusual question now what about if you were to recommend one album one record uh what would that be (laughs) ah how about one song yeah shut up and dance (laughs) our daughter got married in um in Nairobi a few weeks ago, and at the dance party after the wedding, my wife, I was thinking too much about dancing, and she looked at me and she said, shut up and dance. (laughs) And I realized that I was living too much in my head, and too often when we live in environments or work in places that don't support active questioning, that don't support creative energy, we live in our heads too much. And so to me, it's a powerful record. It's a powerful story about just shutting up in your head and dancing, playing, working, building, skiing, you know, whatever it is you do for work, but just do it. And that's the invitation. And a final question for you, Hal. I want you to imagine you woke up tomorrow morning and you have to start from scratch. So you have all the tools, all the the skills and knowledge you've acquired over the years, but no one knows you and you know no one. You have to completely restart. What would you do? How would you restart things? I would be, as much as I possibly can, fully present and like a little zero-year-old, start reaching out with my senses to the world around me, trying to collect new data points and figure out a mental map that could be workable given that my memory has been wiped. And um, I say that in part. Clayton Christensen, a good friend and colleague, um, he had a stroke a few years ago, and he lost the ability to talk. And he had to do exactly what we're talking about. I have enormous admiration for Clay on so many dimensions. But what I love about Clay is that he would do, I think, exactly what I just said. He's just deeply childlike curious about the world and loves, for example, when students tell him, you're dead wrong about your theory. It's an opportunity for a conversation, not an opportunity to crush somebody. So your new book is called Questions Are the Answer and it's uh, out now as well. Where's the best place for people to go to learn more about the book and also more about you and your work? Um, HalGregerson.com has a place that explains more about the book, explains more about my work as the executive director of the Leadership Center at MIT, where frankly, it's one of the most phenomenal places for questions to flourish. Some of the most amazing people I've met here are there. And so that's, that is a, one of the best resources, I think, around who I am and what I do. Fantastic. We'll have all these links here. People go to jamestaylor.me and just look for Hal Gregerson. You're going to have all these links, all the show notes as well. Hal, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing all about your creative life. Thank you, James. It's been a treasure. Thank you. If you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.